from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to ask you to take a seat, please, so that we can go on to our next presentation. So how is everyone? Good, good, good. I've been asked to take care of one little piece of um, housekeeping before uh, we begin. Um, the presentations in the pavilion are being filmed for the Library of Congress website and for their activities. That's that young man, handsome young man that's sitting back there. He's going to wave, and he's going to appreciate that you be mindful of that, um, not bump into the risers, etc., so um, that he can get uh, the best um, filming possible. So with that said, hello, everyone. My name is Lori Montenegro. <laughs> I work for Telemundo Network here in Washington, D.C., and could we have asked for a better day for the National Book Festival? After all that rain in the past years, I think this is a great day. Um, I am certainly very, very excited, muy emocionada. I am very honored. I am uh, honrada to be here today uh, to present our guest author, poet, um, and journalist, Margarita Engel. However, I have a little secret. There's another reason I'm excited, because as uh, Margarita, I am of Cuban descent. Not from Havana, though. I'm from Oriente, but it's Cuba. <laughs> and um, her love for books began when she was very, very young. She started to read when she was young. She started to write since she was very young. And I think we are all blessed the fact that um, she is sharing her gift with us. Um, she has a way with words, and you all know what I mean. But I have to say, as uh, someone who's from the Caribbean, we do have a way with words. Somos muy ocurrentes, as you all know. But seriously, she does have this wonderful gift of prose, and this has earned her many, many awards. For example, for two years in a row now, she has won the Pura Belpre Award. And uh, now, most recently, has won the very prestigious Newberry Honor for The Surrender Tree, her novel about Cuba's fight for independence. It also marks the very, very first time that a Hispanic, una Latina author, has received such a distinction. I love the fact that she says, yes. Let's go. I love the fact that she says, I want to write for young people, not just children, but teenagers, because they are the future. I know how many distractions they have in their lives, and it's a privilege when they actually listen to a poem and ask amazingly intelligent questions, and they think about things and are aware of the world and their surroundings. One critic said she gracefully packs a lot of information into a spare and elegant narrative that will make the historical moment she is describing accessible to a wide range of readers. Another said Engel's prose breathes life into each character and her rich use of language catapults the reader into each setting. This is her first time at the National Book Festival and we hope, Margarita, it is not your last. Can I ask all of you to please stand up? Please let's stand up and welcome her. Give her a warm, una calurosa bienvenida a Margarita Engel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori, for that wonderful introduction. Writing is an exploration. No matter what I set out to write, I always discover that I have explored some aspect of freedom, whether social, emotional, or spiritual. I wrote my most recent novel in verse, The Firefly Letters, because I felt such deep admiration for Friedrika Bremer, a woman who was far ahead of her time, a courageous Swedish women's rights advocate who visited my ancestral homeland of Cuba in 1851 at a time when women simply did not travel alone. Courage and compassion are stories that remain relevant for all of us at any age and in any historical context. With the help of Cecilia, a young, pregnant, enslaved, African-born translator, 
Frederica Bremer wandered all over the Cuban countryside interviewing slaves and freed slaves as well as poor whites from Spain and from Cuba. Her diaries and letters provide the most complete known record of daily life on the island at that time. While researching this story, I became fascinated by the relationship between Frederica and Cecilia. I wondered how they might have influenced each other. And I also imagined Elena, a fictional upper class girl whose chaperoned life was restricted to the indoor world of silks and lace and whose future offered nothing beyond a forced marriage to a wealthy stranger. Could three young women from such different backgrounds become friends? For me, one of the most intriguing aspects of Friedrika Bremer's diary was the image of three young women roaming the countryside buying freedom for fireflies that had been captured by children who used them as playthings. From that point on, the story became one about changing the world by making hopeful choices in situations that seemed hopeless because they would buy freedom for the fireflies, turn them loose, and then the children would capture them again and they'd have to buy their freedom again. And yet they didn't give up, they kept doing this. And it, be, it became a metaphor for me of the struggle for freedom within their human world. My connection to the history of Cuba is personal. My American father traveled to the island after seeing National Geographic pictures of my Cuban mother's hometown of Trinidad on the south central coast. And even though they did not speak the same language, they fell in love at first sight. And since they are both artists who have now been married for 62 years, they, com <laughs> they communicated by passing sketches back and forth. Young people will get in trouble if they repeat this in class, <laughs> but it worked for my parents. They were soon married, and although I was born and raised in my father's hometown of Los Angeles, California, we spent summers in Cuba, where I developed a deep bond with my extended family, and I also developed a lifelong passion for tropical nature and for the mysteries of the island's past. During one of our summer visits to Cuba, diplomatic relations between the island and the U.S. broke down. And after the 1962 missile crisis, travel was forbidden. So even though my experience was not that of a Cuban-born refugee, I felt as if I had inherited a surrealistic form of exile. Life seemed like science fiction. One day I had a huge extended family, and the next day they were as far out of reach as if they were on a distant planet. I wondered about the lives of my cousins. I wondered what my own life would have been like if we had settled in my mother's homeland instead of my father's. And even today, after returning to the island many times as an adult, I still feel a profound sense of wonder about the strangeness of life. That is why I choose poetry, a suitable vessel for the complex riddles of history and the depths of emotion. It is also why I choose to write for young readers who are constantly faced with troubling situations and difficult decisions. I hope that the courage and kindness of the young women I wrote about in the Firefly Letters and of Rosa La Bayamesa and the Surrender Tree, Juan Francisco Manzano and the Poet Slave of Cuba, and of the people in Tropical Secrets, I hope that all of these characters will serve as an inspiration during modern times as young people struggle to make their own 
hopeful choices in situations that might seem hopeless. My other novels and verse for young adults are also tri tributes to this same spirit of courage and compassion. The poet Slava Cuba tells the true story of Juan Francisco Manzano, a child who taught himself how to read and became a great poet despite the obstacles of slavery and cruelty. The Surrender Tree is about Rosa La Baya Mesa, a wilderness nurse who healed soldiers from both sides during Cuba's three wars for independence from Spain. And then when the United States charged into the battle during the final years, which are known in the US as the Spanish-American War, although they are still known in Cuba as the Third War for Independence from Spain. Rosa La Baya Mesa healed American soldiers too. She hid in caves, she hid in jungles, she used wild plants. So again, in a situation that most of us would have seen as hopeless and we'd say, oh, I wish I could help these wounded soldiers or these people who are ill and are suffering from malaria or yellow fever. Um, you know, what can I do? Well, she figured out something to do. She experimented with wild plants. She learned how to use what she had available. And her story is especially amazing because in Cuba, it's as if you combined the War for Independence our Revolutionary War with the Civil War because the struggles for independence from Spain and the struggle for freedom from slavery coincided. They happened at the same time. In October of 1868, planters freed their slaves and went to war against Spain, declared independence, and fought side by side with former slaves for independence from Spain. Rosa La Baya Mesa received her freedom at that time, but instead of going off to the city to enjoy her newfound freedom, she stayed and made the decision to help others. And this is just so amazing to me. I can't imagine that kind of courage and compassion. And so that's why I wanted to write about these types of people, her and Friedrika Bremer and and Juan Francisco Manzano, I write about people that I admire. And truly, I have to say, their stories haunt me until I write about them. And then they continue to haunt me afterwards. I just uh, find them profoundly inspiring. My third young adult novel in verse is called Tropical Secrets, and it's about Holocaust refugees who found a safe harbor in Havana, receiving the kindness of strangers when Cuban teenagers volunteered to teach them Spanish. Again, the kind of uh, courage and compassion involved in a situation like that is hard to imagine, and yet that one is so much more recent in history. And these things that seem so impossible, how could such a thing have occurred, have occurred within the memories of living people. And so I felt like I really wanted to honor the actions that were taken in places where Holocaust refugees did receive the kindness of strangers in a safe harbor. What happened is the ships that left Germany in the late 1930s filled with German Jewish refugees were turned away from New York and Toronto. And then they turned southward and anchored in Havana Harbor until most of the refugees did receive asylum. I think that the, the contribution of several Latin American countries during that period of time is extremely complex because I don't want to sugarcoat it and make it sound like everybody welcomed them. There were tragedies and there were traumas and, and there was trickery, but 
most of the refugees did actually become Cuban. And I wanted to write about the um, adjustment that it was for them to think that they were headed for New York and were going to have to learn English and then end up in the tropics having to learn Spanish and become Cuban. In March of 2011, my next novel in verse will be released. It's called Hurricane Dancers, the first Caribbean pirate shipwreck. It's set in 1509, a much more difficult time period to research because so little was written that long ago. And that which was written was only written from one point of view, <laughs> from the Spanish point of view since they had the written language. This book is about the dramatic encounter between peaceful Cuban Indians on the south central coast, near what later, be just a few years later, became my mother's hometown, and the first Caribbean pirate who was shipwrecked along with his hostage, a brutal conquistador, During the course of the research for this book, I became a subject of the Cuban DNA Project, verifying what I had always instinctively suspected. My maternal DNA is Native American. For five centuries, virtually all history books have stated with absolute certainty that all Cuban Indians are extinct. But the history books were wrong, and DNA studies are proving this. Maternal DNA studies in particular, because women did survive the near genocide of the 1511 conquest of Cuba by Spain. So I wanted to write about the Taino and Sibone Indians, and also about the mixed race children, because by 1509, there were already children who were half Spanish and half Indian. And the Spaniards, Africans were not the first slaves in Cuba. The Spaniards enslaved the Cuban Indians during those early years and the mixed-race children were known as broken children. So I really wanted to write about those survivors who did manage in body as well as spirit to overcome incredible odds. Now when I research a historical topic, I try to read everything that I can get my hands on with fresh eyes, asking myself whether the people telling a story really understood their subject or were they merely repeating rumors. In order to be sure that I've researched thoroughly, I use interlibrary loan, borrowing diaries and other older references that are not always available completely online yet. I search especially for first-person accounts because they contain the emotional aspects of daily life, answering the question, what did it feel like to be alive at that time? Once the research is complete, the process of writing begins. And while research is painstaking and meticulous, poetry is expansive and imaginative. And my hope is that the two moods will blend, offering a glimpse into the lives of people who lived long ago. When I write a novel in verse, I feel as if wilderness is one of my characters. Forests, animals, and this Cuban weather that we have here today are powerful forces in my stories. And that is because I studied agriculture and botany along with creative writing. And I did that because I loved my uh, ancestors' farm in Cuba so much. 
It was a farm that I visited during those childhood summers, and it has essentially become uh, part of my imaginary world, sort of a magical world that I enter whenever I write about Cuba. I do have one picture book for younger children and another one coming out as, um, in another year or so. The one that's available now is called Summer Birds. It's subtitled The Butterflies of Maria Marion. Maria Sibylla Marion and my interest in her comes from my botany and agriculture training. Uh, she, was a six, she was a woman who lived in the 1600s and became an amazing scientific illustrator, scientist, and explorer, again, at a time when women just did not travel alone. And she studied butterfly life cycles and disproved the theory of spontaneous generation uh, long before any of the men who got credit for that work. And my next picture book is about wilderness search and rescue dogs because in my real life, in my spare time, my husband trains uh, search and rescue dogs to find lost hikers in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, and I'm a volunteer victim. I hide in the forest so that the dogs can <laughs> practice finding some of one. Much of my writing is actually done during those quiet hours when I wait to be found. <laughs> and thank you so much for your attention, and I just uh, would be happy to answer any questions. This has been a wonderful experience. Yes. Thank you. Please come to the microphone when you do have a question. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that's actually a very interesting question because I started to write Summer Birds about 25 years ago oh. when I was still a practicing botanist and a, and a professor of agronomy. And um, at that time, I did submit it a f to a few places for publication, but there wasn't really an interest ah. yet in the publishing world in women who were far ahead of their time. So I brought it back out from its hiding place in a drawer in, in my office and tried again uh, many years later. Are you familiar with the book Goldsmith on the Rocks by Danita Atkin? Uh, yes. Uh, and, and of course, it's the new Kingsley Honor, the Evolution of California Takes. And like the author, that was one of the sort of uh, potential for that book, I feel. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. I hope I didn't miss this, but um, where did you first hear about the Holocaust survivors that came to Cuba? Because I had never heard of that until your book. You know, I'm just shocked at how little known it is. There's an amazing nonfiction study for adults, very detailed, called Tropical uh, Diaspora by, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the first name, but it's Levine. <laughs> and it, it's just, it's what alerted me to this um, incredible subject that should be better known. And not just Cuba, but some other Latin American countries also received a great many Holocaust refugees who had been turned away from the US and Canada. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Which authors do you turn to as like a mentor text, like books that you read and inspire you? Not like um, how to write books, but ones that help you to write better? I love poetry, and I just read poetry every day before I do anything else. Um, early in the morning, I grab whatever poetry book is closest at hand, and I'll read the same poetry books over and over. But I really have to credit uh, Karen Hess's Witness as the book that uh, helped to give me a form for the Poet Slave of Cuba, the, the multiple voice novel and verse. I did get that idea from her book, Witness. 
I had been trying to write about Juan Francisco Manzano in prose, and it just never worked. And as soon as I switched to a novel in verse form inspired by her, um, I've never met her, but I always try to credit that book, uh, th it just flowed. So I think he was kind of maybe reaching down, pounding on me on the head and saying, I was a poet, write about me in poetry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I am Jacqueline Jules, and I met you in yes. Seattle at the AJL convention where you uh, won yes, the thank uh, you. Sydney Taylor Award for Tropical Secrets. And while I was there, I bought Surrender Tree. I wrote it. I read it on the um, the plane ride home. And after that, I read Firefly Letters and thank Tropical you. Secrets, and I just loved all three of them. Thank you and I so just much. To thank you for those books. Thank, thank you. you so much. And, and your question reminds me to acknowledge the Sydney Taylor Award, which is a, a wonderful award for Tropical Secrets. And I do want to mention that my personal connection to that story is I did say that my father is American and traveled to Cuba, but he, his, he was born and raised in Los Angeles, but his parents came to the US from the Ukraine as refugees from uh, pogroms. So I do have a personal connection to that story as well. Hi, I actually happen to be a Cuban refugee from Costa Trinidad, and I was wondering, uh, what's your favorite Cuban writer or author? Well, you know, you and I might be cousins because that's a small town. Small. <laughs> Everybody I've ever met from there is a cousin. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I just read Cristina Garcia's uh, The Lady Matador's Hotel and really enjoyed it. And um, for young adult books, I really enjoyed Nancy Osa's Cuba 15. And I just love uh, so many poets and authors that my mind is cluttering up with names and I can't choose one. I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for being here. Yes. Are there any other reasons you decided to write in verse? I feel like, for me, verse really helps me um, decide what I want to write about. Because I can't fit everything on that page. I end up with a very uncrowded page. And I really have to narrow my focus down to the things that are the most important to me. What aspects I really want to um, and, and at the same time, I feel like I can put emotions in poetry that they're just, with all the crowded page, there wouldn't be room for those emotions in the same way in, say, a nonfiction history book. And I love to read a nonfiction history book, but it's just not my passion for writing. My passion is with poetry. Thank, Thank you. you. Are you a poet? Thank you. Hello, my, my congratulations Thank to you. you rising to this stature. Thank Here's you. my problem. My wife is a first-time author. It is difficult <laughs> to get published if you're a first-time author. So what we did is we self-published, and it's coming out in September. But the problem is, how do you get recognized? <laughs> do, you have, do you have an agent? No, I do not. I do not have an agent. Um, I sent the poet slave of Cuba into what is called the slush pile. The slush pile is thousands and thousands and thousands of books that editors sift through, and I just am so grateful that an editor's assistant pulled the poet slave of Cuba out of the slush pile and did um, give it a chance. So. We'll but good luck. We'll try real hard. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm just wondering if your um, books are distributed in Cuba, and if so, what kind of reception they've received, especially for the Poet Slave of Cuba. Uh, thank you for asking that. No, they aren't. There would not be any format for an American bookseller to sell books in Cuba. Um, the only one of my books that is at present in a bilingual format is The Surrender Tree, which is, is published now in a paperback that has the entire novel in verse in English first, and then the entire novel in verse in Spanish 
in the same volume. It's not a facing page bilingual translation. Um, but I just don't think that at present there would be a format for American publishers to, uh, I, th I think it, it would violate the Trading with the Enemies Act of 1962. Um, I'm guessing at that, but I just don't think that there would be a format. Yeah. Thank you so much. You've just been a wonderful audience. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.